thank you for the introduction. It is a really weird um, confluence of two things, being an exploration geologist and then working where I am at the moment. But I'm going to try to explain a little bit of how I kind of think it worked and also why I'm kind of passionate about, about this. Um, basically, um, geology is a science, as I'm sure you know, but actually it's more of an art, as anyone who's actually ever done it knows. Trying to figure out what's underneath the surface of the Earth is really um, creative. We'll put it that way. And, uh, and I think, you know, for me, that intersection of sort of interpretation and creativity has kind of given me those skills. But I guess, you know, people ask me why or how I managed to sort of transition to doing social impact consulting. And I could tell them about, yeah, I've gone back and restudied and I wanted a lifestyle change and... Um, you know, I, I've done courses and all that sort of stuff and, uh, and learned a, lo a lot along the way. But I think the biggest thing is that it was a really big change in perspective for me um, and getting out of my own head and seeing something um, from a really different perspective is actually, you know, some things that my kids were saying, um, they were sort of at that sort of four and five-year-old about, um, you know, not seeing me and... Um, and, and then, you know, having that sort of wanting to have a sense of purpose in the work that I was doing, not just enjoying the work that I was doing, but that sense of purpose. So um, to bring it back to, I guess, why I, I'm really uh, passionate about talking about this topic is that um, I think it's really important to take lots of different perspectives on things, to ask lots of different questions, particularly when it comes to the problem you're trying to solve. So my talk's going to be really focused on the sort of front end of things, not so much the solution. Um, because I think, yeah, as, we, as we've sort of heard earlier as well, the, the, how you define problems is really important. Um, you know, as humans, we're really hardwired to... Actually, I didn't grab that clicker. Sorry. Ah, there it is. Excellent. Um, as humans, we're really hardwired to just sort of jump straight into solutions. So, you know, we come up with a problem, we go, oh, yeah, yeah, we can fix this, or, you know, you've got a team, let's have a brainstorming session, you know, get in and we'll find the right problem. So, you know, what's wrong with this? Well, how often do we ask ourselves, as behaviour change practitioners or social marketers, how much our own irrationalities actually, um, you know, frame the problems that we're trying to solve? So, a lot of us know about, you know, the various biases that exist and, in fact, we try to, you know, use them in many ways um, to actually, you know, create change. But um, I want to admit that I guess in my experience and, you know, for my colleagues as well, a constant challenge is actually being aware of our own perspectives. Um, and, you know, they, they actually kind of insidiously creep up and sort of frame the thing that you're trying to do and it's really hard, I think, to keep going back and, and just checking in. So, although this can happen at any stage of a project, um, I really think that the, when it creates the most problems is right at the start, because the worst thing you can do is solve a problem that doesn't actually exist. So, how can we counter this? So, I think one of the most um, effective kind of uh, things you can do is to apply three key strategies. The first one is um, being able to really define the problem, so make sure it is an actual problem. Uh, the second one is reframing, and we sort of um, touched on that a little bit this morning, and I'll go into a little bit more. And the third one is delving into the assumptions. So, um, you know, and we, we touched on that a little bit this morning as well. So getting out of your own head and your own perspectives. Um, and I guess, you know, what I try to do is, is you know, um, apply some of those human-centred design principles to that front end of the problem. And I'm just going to show you some really practical examples from our work. Um, so I hope you gain something from it. These are the examples I'm going to use. They're all um, community-based social marketing projects. Um, they are, uh, I guess... All, as I said, very local. So I just kind of want to explain um, some of the things that, as I'm going to sort of come back into these afterwards. So we're going to look at um, a project that we were encouraging the uptake of rooftop solar panels by businesses. Um, one where we were looking at um, preventing the uptake of smoking by young people in an Aboriginal community. Uh, one around tackling illegal dumping and one around sort of discouraging car use and, you know, encouraging more sustainable transport options in a community. And you can see these are, you know, across um, a range of issues here. But I kind of want to show you that, you know, it's the same sort of process and, and techniques. Um, 
So this is, uh, I guess, our very broad kind of model for how we approach community-based social marketing projects. It is based loosely on the Doug McKenzie Moore type of model, um, but we do incorporate just a lot, I guess, a fair bit more work up in this front part in the problem definition. Um, and, and we really want it to be quite iterative. Um, so uh, I guess here, you know, my key point is that you need to spend more time there. Although I do accept that there are times or issues that you do want to sort of jump straight in. You know, you've identified a fairly clear barrier, um, and you want to, you know, jump straight in and use, utilize the social marketing tools, or you know, apply a nudge or whatever it might be. Um, so I want to look at the types of problems that this is this is also more appropriate for. Right, so the first strategy is around that problem definition. Um, and I guess, you know, the most important question you can ask at the start of any change project is, are we solving the right problem? Does this problem really exist for the people who we're trying to, to do something for? Um, does it matter to the community? And does it matter to the target audience? So, I don't know if many people have seen this. You've probably seen this map before. It's a map of obesity. If you Google obesity systems map, it'll come up. It's really great because it's kind of interactive and it shows you all the different, how the systems kind of interact together. Um, but I think it's just a great example of a complex problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's, it's a really good example of a complex problem. And... I'm going to say something a bit controversial, actually, um, and it probably goes back to this morning's uh, conversation about trying to solve wicked problems with social marketing. So I think that for behaviour change and social marketing um, problems, we need to not be too broad or too narrow. But I do think that we need to make it relatively specific because otherwise it just becomes too complex. There's too many moving parts in that system. You don't know what you're going to, you know, affect or, or some of the causes that are coming in. There's too many inputs and outputs, you know, that are in the whole system. I do think, you know, the Logan um, together is a, a good example of that sort of more collaborative, multi-stakeholder, uh, collective impact is a great way to tackle those complex pr uh, problems and sort of shift the needle. But um, I guess, you know, particularly for behaviour change projects, my personal opinion is that there's just too many interrelated causes and effects um, that not only make behaviours more difficult to influence, but also that change would almost be impossible to attribute. So, yeah, I guess that's my kind of controversial idea. Um, if we want to solve really complex, wicked problems, we need to be really collaborative and have lots of behaviour change programs going on at the same time towards the same purpose over a long period of time. But anyway, we can talk about that later at questions. Um, so I guess, the, the, you know, the next thing is to try to locate the problem that you can solve, so to make sure that you know where you are in that system um, and, you know, to know your inputs and outputs there. Um, and I want to show you an example, uh, and also, I guess, understanding that the context. So, you know, you want to know, you know, who you're trying to affect, obviously, you know, um, why you're trying to, um, you know, change that and, you know, what the sort of time frame is that you're looking at. So this is an example from the solar installation um, uh, project that we're working on. And I just want to show you, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's basically showing you one of our kind of mistakes in framing at the start. Um, we, people came to us with this problem um, very much around marketing. So, you know, we know that electricity is a, is a large cost for many businesses. Um, but in Noosa, there's only 5% uptake of rooftop solar, right, by businesses compared to almost 40% by residents. Why is that? You know, we did the desktop research, right, and there's a clear business case for putting solar on roofs for businesses. There's a payback, you can see, payback period of 3.5 to 5 years and, you know, they're, they're there for up to 35 years. So we went, oh, well, obviously they just don't know about the benefits. Obviously. So this is an example, I guess, of using... Um, how many people have heard of the five whys? 
yeah, quite a few. It's a, it's a really easy technique to kind of reframe or to, to delve into problems to make sure that you're solving the right problems. It's just really asking why. It's, it's channeling your inner five-year-old. <laughs> um, so I, I'll just quickly go through this one. I mean, we had our assumption, um, as I mentioned, about the marketing. Um, why is it so much lower? Well, businesses obviously just don't know about those benefits. So, yep, we've got a, a marketing awareness campaign right in our pocket here. We can do that. But what we found when we actually did primary research, when we went and talked to people, is that there's no motivation to change. Why? Why is there no motivation to change? Well, maybe it's because people are time poor. They, you know, the switching costs are too much. Or they, you know, they just don't have the time to put into that. But what if electricity costs isn't actually a motivator or incentive for change? Why? Well, the key thing here is that the business owners are the ones who are paying the electricity bills, but most of them are leaseholders in the area that we're looking at. So, you know, the landlords are making the infrastructure decision, but there's no kind of cost benefit to them. They're not gaining the reward. So, you know, it was a, an interesting kind of process for us to go through and realise that, yeah, we had the wrong problem. So I want to talk about the second strategy, which is around framing problems. And you can see from that previous um, example that, you know, we would need to reframe that problem to how can we incentivise um, not just businesses but um, landlords to install solar. So... Reframing problems talked about a lot. Um, you've probably, I'm sure you've heard of it, you know, before, and you know, there's lots of techniques. But in practice, I've found that people find it really hard. They find it really hard to get out of their own heads, um, to question their own assumptions. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things that, yeah, it sounds like you can just flip something around, but you know, it, especially if the problem means a lot to you, um, it can be really difficult to do. Just recently, I had a um, a workshop, some workshop feedback where someone just sent me like an emoji with the head exploding. So I'm not too sure if that was like good or whether that was bad, but anyway, I took it as kind of good, like, you know, my mind's open. Um, but reframing problems as well is kind of, it's it's actually, there are some, some methods that you can use um, and it's not as hard as it sort of looks if you just, you know, the five whys is one of those. Um, flipping the problem around, like we, um, Amantha talked about earlier today, is a really good way to reframe. Um, using a metaphor is a great way to reframe. Um, or you could just try refocusing. So really focusing in on what, you know, the needs of people, um, you know, and understanding the experience of them as we've heard lots about this, you know, this morning and today. Um, their pains and gains and challenging your own perspectives. So I'll show you a few examples of where we've done this um, with our projects. Um, when we worked with a local Aboriginal organisation down in Adelaide, um, uh, the project was, or the brief, I guess, was to try to, you know, help prevent the uptake of smoking by young people. Now, smoking is one of those things that... Um, it has been quite successful um, in non-Aboriginal communities. Um, it actually turns out the smoking rates are decreasing in, in Aboriginal communities as well. Just not as fast or there hasn't been as much progress um, as for non-Aboriginal people. So um, we, we implemented this campaign, but one of the first things we found was that the, the negative, um, you know, cigarette packet type advertising, that didn't work at all. In fact, the kids were like sort of gathering them and then comparing to see one had the was most disgusting, right? So, you know, that's that's not going to help. Um, they also, um, you know, as we as you mentioned, Penny, like, you know, if someone tells you to do something, do you want to do it? No way, right? And especially for teenagers. You tell a teenager to do something, they're just going to do the exact opposite. So we needed to move from telling them what not to do to focusing on what they really wanted. And the research, and we, again, primary research and talking to kids was that they wanted to have a focus on their dreams. You know, they, their own futures, their own aspirations. So the, the thing about the campaign was that it flipped around from focusing on don't smoke, or oh, smoking's bad for you, or it's disgusting, whatever it is, to reframing to that positive, you know, let's concentrate on their strengths, on, on, on people's own uh, ideas and aspirations. And actually, as Natasha was saying, um, you know, they were able to share their own stories about that as well. And it was a much easier thing to share about than smoking. 
Um, this is my pet project because it was in my hometown and we worked on this, um, f there was a terrible illegal um, dumping problem in the forest um, just near town and it, was, it used to be a great place to go, take your kids, free play, that sort of thing and then there was just, you know, this influx of dumping and, um, and so we were like, right, we're going to do something about this. And so there was a lot of sentiment in the community, like, dumpers are grubs, you know, we've got to stop them dumping, we're going to put more cameras in, we're going to find people more, um, you know, there's all these ideas, you know, really negative ideas, but, you know, the community was behind that because they wanted it to stop. Um, but what we ended up doing is, through the research, really figuring out that it wasn't, the problem actually wasn't um, the gr people dumping, there was lots of reasons why people were dumping and some of them weren't obvious either and I'll get to some of those. But the real reason people were dumping in that forest was because they didn't value the forest anymore. It had become a dumping ground. So by galvanising the community back around the forest, so we had, you know, different uh, community groups and, uh, you know, the mountain biking club and everyone sort of coming around, beautifying the forest, um, really enjoying enjoying the area again, the dumping actually stopped almost, you know, it went down by 80% in the first, after the campaign, um, which, was, which was amazing. And it really showed that power of sort of not um, saying, how can we stop dumping in the forest? How can we um, help the, the community to really value that space again? And, you know, we had a cute little wombat as a, <laughs> which the kids loved as a little mascot. Uh, another example of reframing uh, is the work that we're doing in Noosa around the um, trying to treat people to more sustainable modes of transport. And that was very much brought to us as a problem around reducing congestion. Um, believe it or not, Noosa has bad traffic problems, probably not. I hate saying this to people in the city because it's... <laughs> You know, it's a little bit of street down towards Hastings Street. Um, but <laughs> locals get really upset about it. Um, so, the, you know, our brief was kind of to, to look at doing something in a way of behaviour change to shift people to more sustainable modes of transport. But what we started to realise, the first thing is that the more cars you take off there, the, the more that are going to drive. So, you know, it just becomes an incentive. Um, secondly, we had a real mind shift, and, and this includes the council that we're working with. Um, so instead of it being, let's shift people to other sustainable modes of transport, active transport, public transport, how can we make the experience better for them? You know, how can we make it really fun to jump on a shuttle bus, an electric bus, you know, whatever it might be, and have that Noosa brand and that feel? And that can be for locals, and then they can promote it to tourists. And, you know, it just becomes a really kind of fun thing to do, and it sort of builds on those social norms. So from, from just using something to really having an experience, and from prescribing, saying, you know, go use public, public transport, to, you know, how can we actually inspire people to change? So, I, yeah, what was it? Um, I don't have another hand. This is probably in well, anyway, but, you know, what was it? Crushed assumptions? Um, I think that was really good. I, I think assumptions are the absolute key. Um, one of the biggest things about assumptions that, and how they arise is that um, we just don't get in the field and talk to people enough. And when I say that, as people have said before me, it means um, getting into the field in situations where those people already exist. It's not going in as a researcher or as a something formal. The best information comes from people who are um, just where they are and you have a discussion with them. And, you know, you use gentle probing questions to sort of draw out some of the underlying reasons why. We don't have a set of discussion. You know, we might have a little bit of a framing of, of what we want to talk to people about, but it's actually the conversations that you get those really deep insights. Um, you know, but of course, people's kind of um, stated preferences aren't always the reality, as we know. So it is actually important to kind of test that, they, which is, you know, fair enough too, because when you're asking someone about a problem, and we're still talking about problems here, we sort of identified a problem and then we want to ask people what they think about the problem. Um, we can't necessarily expect them to sort of get out of their own... Uh, you know, their own mindset and, and, you know, in their situation and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't thought about it like this or that. It's just, it's just being able to draw out the insights that can help us to shape and change our perspective. So, I just want to go through a couple of examples again, you know, mistakes um, that we've made along the way. Maybe they can be good examples for you. Um, the first one is around the forest environment again. Um, and gosh, there were so many assumptions we made which was just totally wrong. 
Um, one of the key ones was actually on price. So people told us that they didn't, they wouldn't take their waste to the tip because it was way too expensive. I'm, you know, I'm just going to go dump in the forest. Um, and when we asked them what, like, what they thought the price was to take their stuff to the tip, they were saying like two or three times more than what it actually was. Plus, they didn't know that they could take half the stuff that they were dumping for free because it was recyclable or, you know, white goods, all that stuff was free. So they were, yeah, it was a big assumption that we made that they were just doing that because of price, but it was also inherent in the actual problem. It's, it's, the problem was actually a lack of communication here. Um, and secondly, we did, you know, we'd sort of done some personas based on the, um, the rubbish that was dumped around potentially the people who were dumping the rubbish. And one of the, you know, real mistakes that was made in that was that when we actually went on the ground and talked to people, and particularly around this tradie waste at the top, we thought, oh, you know, they're just dumping stuff. It's not tradie waste. It was, it was people stealing tradies' cars and dumping their stuff out of the back of it. You know, but we just made this assumption that they were like a persona in our, in our strategy. So um, really important to kind of challenge, you know, all your thinking around it and challenge it on the ground with real people. Um, last week I was uh, in India and we were um, looking at social enterprises there, social enterprise models in Bangalore. And... We were doing this great project with the sort of uh, plastics recycling um, initiative, which was, was really great, hearing about some of those lessons. And it was really interesting because, um, you know, it happens everywhere. So they, they'd had this great idea about, um, you know, micro-entrepreneurship for the sweeper women um, who sweep up the, the waste in the morning. They, there was this great little... Um, great little kind of machine that they could use to sort of sort it out and, you know, add value by having this sorted waste that they could sell on to, um, to council and to other buyers that would buy the, um, the recycling. But um, so there was, it was looking great. It had this wonderful business model around it as well, you know, like there was all this, this markets for recycled plastic and clothes and all this sort of stuff. And then after that problem was already defined and oh, the solution was pretty much defined, they went and talked to... Uh, the, the sweeper women on the streets, and they didn't want to do micro-entrepreneurship. Like, they didn't want a business. They wanted some security, you know. They wanted to be employed. They had families and kids, and they didn't want to, you know, be empowered to have their own businesses. Um, so the model shifted to employing people, you know, on a good living wages, which is what they really wanted. <laughs> but no one had asked them beforehand. So, again, a, a, an example of assumptions. And the last one I want to say is that um, we often make assumptions, particularly around um, people that are not like us. And I reckon a lot of young, young people are a real key group for that. Um, so we were doing an a, um, education campaign and uh, we sort of made an assumption that we we're going to build this awesome, like, digital product that they were going to interact with. It was really going to be really cool. Um, and then when we went and talked to students... Thank goodness. I'm like, we don't want another digital product. Like, obviously, we can just play with what we like to play with at home. What we want to do is have an experience, you know, out in the field. We want to go and see the sewage treatment plant, you know, feel it on the ground, you know, smell it, whatever. You know, they've had enough of all this digital sort of stuff kind of being thrust at them. So, yeah, another example of, of really wrong assumptions. Anyhow. <laughs> I'm just, um, I'm going to sort of wrap up, actually. Um, but I just want to reiterate that those are the three key things I think you need to do right at the start um, so that you do ask the right questions. And um, this is like my favourite quote of all time, um, but it goes exactly to why um, this problem, uh, you know, that I'm so passionate about this. Um, in our really sort of uh, busy society now, we really value execution, I think, you know, having ideas and then executing on them. And that was talked about this morning about sort of getting stuff done. And maybe that is just the reality that we live in. Um, yeah, the person who sort of does that is sort of seen as the hero. And the person who sits and asks more questions is seen as a procrastinator, you know, or they're seen as a pain in the ass because they're asking more questions. <laughs> And, you know, you just want to get to the solution. Um, but, you know, Einstein was, he spent, like, most of his time thinking. He hardly spent any time doing. 
you know, he's a pretty successful human, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, it may not be how we operate at the moment, but, you know, he made lots and lots of time for contemplation, for testing assumptions, for experimentation, and just thinking. So, in my opinion, and you can you know, take this as you will, but um, I think we need to spend more time being more like Einstein and less running off and, and sort of trying to save the world with our own solutions. And that's it. Any questions? Anyone want to challenge me about the complex problems thing? <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Um, that was really good. Just a question. Um, I'm really curious about your the map that you showed of the complexity in a system. Can you just talk us through how you did that? Oh, sorry. That is that's not my map. Um, so that actually comes from. Um, it's called Shift N. If you want to look it up, I think it is. Um, it's a. If you just Google obesity system map. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's a project in the UK that mapped all of those yeah, factors I understand. together. Yeah. Have you ever used it? Um, no, I haven't because we haven't done a particular. I've used that method before uh -huh. in terms of making a system map. Yeah. Um, but How I haven't complicated used or um, user friendly is it? Making a system map? Yeah. Uh, look, I just think it takes careful thought um, about the interaction. So uh, generally thinking about each of the, the, the problems that are kind of identified, how they fit together and the causes and effects, and then mapping those causes and effects. So I, I don't know if anyone's done like a problem tree. It's kind of similar to doing a problem tree, yeah. You start with, with that and then you think what causes that and what effects does that have? And then you, you actually start getting other sort of major issues in there and then you sort of do the same thing for each of them. 